Uh, good morning, everyone. I think I'll get started, and if other people walk in, we'll hopefully they'll be able to catch up. So today's first talk is going to be on sidechains and proofs of proofs. Uh, you've heard about some of this by Agelos yesterday, uh, discussing sidechains, sort of all of filos, uh, proofs of proofs of work, proofs of proofs of stake. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit more depth about what these are. Um, so this is uh, collaborative work. The, the sidechains paper we are preparing now is with um, Peter Gassi and Agelos. And the previous paper on proofs of proofs of work is um, something we have with um, Agelos and uh, Andre Miller. So what you're going to see here is collaborative work um, taken from both of these works. So. You, this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's basically two parts in the talk. The first is going to be about sidechains in general, and then the second part is, is going to be about proofs of proofs, and specifically proofs of proofs of work. Um, the first part of the, side ch the, the talk, the sidechains, uh, I want everybody to, to be able to understand it. So you don't need any special knowledge, any technical knowledge. It's not going to be technical. So everybody should be able to follow. So if you have any questions during that part, feel free to ask. Right? Um, and then the second part, um, I wanted to also give uh, uh, some details for the technical people that have some knowledge of cryptography. So it's going to be a shorter part. Uh, I'm going to go in, into some technical details. Uh, hopefully, everybody will get a, a gist of what this looks like in general, but maybe not every uh, technical detail. So don't worry if you uh, don't follow everything. All right, so let's get started. So for sidechains, uh, that's the history of it. So in 2014, it was uh, proposed by some people who are now mostly on Blockstream. So it's Adam Back, um, Mark Friedenbach, and Andrew Miller, and so on. Um, they wrote this paper called Enabling Blockchain Innovations with Pegged Sidechains. And um, that was a high-level overview of what they wanted to achieve with sidechains, the idea of what it is, which I'm going to go to uh, immediately. But they didn't have any technical details of how to, uh, how to do it, and especially not um, for Bitcoin. OK, so what is a sidechain? Uh, we have here two blockchains. One is Bitcoin, one is Ethereum Classic. And um, they have two Genesis blocks that I have there with green. They're, they're separate blocks. And these blockchains are, both of them are independent. They are standalone, and they, they are separate systems that work on their own. Now, the idea is that sometimes you want them to communicate. Uh, so I'm going to be using the Bitcoin example uh, throughout these slides. Uh, unfortunately, Bitcoin um, is unlikely to be able to work with these schemes. So take it with a grain of salt, because um, maybe it needs certain updates that Bitcoin is not willing to do. Uh, so let's see what a sidechain is. Now, the, the blockchain is um, growing, so blocks are produced. Um, of course, maybe not at the same rate. It doesn't matter. And at some point, um, a certain event happens within the, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. Now. Blocks keep getting produced, and that event is eventually confirmed after enough blocks are put upon that event. And then um, we want the Ethereum Classic to be aware of that. So the Ethereum Classic learns about that event, and that event that happened on the Bitcoin blockchain becomes available to the Ethereum Classic blockchain as a piece of information that this thing took place. And then, this, of course, also this gets confirmed and um, the, the Bitcoin Classic blockchain here can react to that event. So it can have an action that is the result of an event in the, in the Bitcoin blockchain. And if you're familiar with these systems, you'll notice that usually smart contracts are closed systems. They, they can't really interact with the network. They can't go on a website. Um, they can only look at blockchain data. So this is something new, right? And the question is, how do we really uh, do that? So there's, there's two blockchains in the scheme, the source blockchain and the destination blockchain. Um, the source blockchain is where the event happened here. And the destination is where we want to react to this event. And 
depending on the use cases, the same blockchain could be a, both a source and destination blockchain. So you could have also an event in Ethereum Classic happening and Bitcoin reacting, for instance. Right? So these roles can switch. And also, uh, another thing is that here, I have just one event noted. But uh, it's not impossible that you'll have multiple events going on in parallel. So multiple things happen on the Bitcoin blockchain. These events are propagated to the Ethereum Classic blockchain. And there's multiple reactions occurring at the bottom and vice versa. So this is just, I'm just giving you one event, a snapshot of one event to see, to study what, what's going on. But of course, there's going to be parallel uh, events happening. All right. So for, support, for supporting these blockchains, for, uh, these side chains, we need certain features that we don't yet have in all blockchains. So one of them is about the uh, source blockchain. We need, depending on its type, whether it's a stake blockchain or a work blockchain, we need something called um, proof, of, proof of work or proof of proof of stake. And um, we can uh, likely build it. So this is going to be the second part of the talk. Um, we, we know how to make proofs of proofs of work. And uh, Agalos is working also on a proofs of, uh, proof of stake scheme um, with uh, Peter, right? So uh, this is also something that's being worked on. And then the destination blockchain, it has to be smart. So it has to be able to run some code that can uh, do a certain amount of verification. So we're a, a bit limited on what blockchains we can use for this. If we look into the situation right now, um, there is no serious support for, for sidechains. There is no implementation that really works. There's maybe um, a few things. There's a drive chain, BTC, Relay. Um, uh, maybe a couple others, but they, they don't really work or they have security issues uh, that are very serious. Um, and um, in order to, to make it work, it's not sufficient to know how to build these proofs of proofs or to have smart contracts. We also need to start including certain pieces of metadata into the source blockchain. Uh, and um, this can be done with um, a series of different forks, so either hard fork or soft fork, or a new concept that we call a velvet fork. And uh, the bottom one, the velvet fork, is the least disrupt disruptive of these, and it can be user initiated. So the nice part about velvet forks is that users can do them. We don't need minor approval to do them. Uh, and hopefully, uh, we will start uh, in actually next week, we will start. Uh, injecting this metadata into the Litecoin or the Bitcoin Cash um, blockchain just to experiment. So this is something we have planned. Um, and then the destination blockchain, uh, if it has smart contract support, it should work in principle. But the difficult part is that these um, algorithms to run within the smart contract, they can get quite complicated and gas heavy. So uh, sometimes it may require some of the primitives uh, of the smart contract to be imp implemented in the virtual machine itself. All right, so let's look at what kind of events can be uh, supported and reacted to. So some of the uh, events are here. I have some examples. But really, you can react to anything that you would be able to react if it was your own blockchain. So if you're writing a smart contract for Ethereum Classic and you can react to some event that happens in Ethereum Classic, a similar event that happens to, to Bitcoin, the source blockchain, you can react to. For example, um, I was paid. Uh, a particular block was created. Um, uh, a certain uh, account has a certain amount of money, or some money was moved out of an account, or a certain smart contract was uh, executed. So these are kinds of things that we can react to um, on the destination blockchain um, when things happen on the source blockchain. So that's, uh, yeah, those are some things. Uh, in general, there's no, there's no uh, particular limit. Like if, if it's part of your application layer um, in, in a local blockchain, you can, you can do it cross-chain as well. So the challenge is, as I said, that miners don't really monitor block, uh, both blockchains, right? So if you have a miner that's running on Ethereum Classic, it doesn't really know about, about Bitcoin. It can't go to the Bitcoin blockchain to learn what's happening. It only knows its local state. Uh, so the question is, how do we isolate these two networks, but still be able to verify that everything is okay here? And the way to do that is we do proofs of proofs. 
Um, so what is a proof of proof? Uh, a proof of proof is takes this thing, uh, which is the, the source blockchain. It looks at some event that has happened here. It has been confirmed. And then any full node that has this state locally uh, can take the local ledger state and compress it into a single uh, piece of text, a small piece of text that we call a proof of proof. So what is this? This is a, a proof that this event happened, doesn't matter what it is, within the Bitcoin blockchain. And this thing, if I show it to anyone, uh, they can look at it and be sure, be certain that this event took place in the Bitcoin blockchain without interacting with the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's the, that's the key component that allows us to do this kind of isolation. Okay, so here is the protocol. Um, so initially, uh, Alice sees that this event has happened on the Bitcoin blockchain. So for example, Alice could make a payment, could initiate a payment herself on the Bitcoin blockchain and waits for it to be confirmed. Now once it has been confirmed, Alice will generate this proof of proof. So for Bitcoin's case, it's a, it's a proof of proof of work and then um, includes it in the destination blockchain. So it's put within that block. And then um, that's also waited to be confirmed. And then that can cause uh, an event to happen on the target blockchain, depending on your smart contract rules, right? So the smart contract within the Ethereum Classic blockchain here would be able to take that string, that proof, as input, look at it, validate that it looks OK, validate that it's actually a, a true proof of what happened, an account of events, and then react to it in the way that the smart contract developer uh, wishes. OK. So some applications. Uh, the, the obvious one, I guess, is uh, atomic swaps. So this is um, perhaps already possible with other means, but uh, this is one more way to do it. Um, so the idea here is that um, Bob holds some uh, Bitcoin, um, Alice holds some Ethereum, and then they want to exchange it, but nobody wants to transfer first, right? So how can we do that with, um, with, with side chains? Well, one way is just to um, create a smart contract within the Ethereum blockchain that waits for a Bitcoin transfer to happen on the Bitcoin blockchain. And once that happens, react by paying on the Ethereum blockchain. OK, so the way that will work is if, if Bob has Bitcoin, Alice has Ethereum, Alice creates a uh, Bitcoin address that she wants to receive the Bitcoin into. And then she also creates a smart contract paying her uh, Ethereum into that smart contract with a time lock, let's say, of two days, right? And then that smart contract has a rule that if Alice's account is paid on the Bitcoin blockchain, a certain amount of Bitcoin, it will release the amount of Ether that Alice has locked into the Ethereum uh, smart contract to uh, Bob's address. So now Bob seeing this, seeing that the smart contract has been created and is confirmed and contains his address, pays into Alice's uh, Bitcoin account with his Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain. And then the, uh, the smart contract on um, the Ethereum blockchain releases Alice's uh, Ethereum to Bob's address. So this is nice because it's atomic and they can uh, exchange these uh, coins at the same time, right? So this is one application. Now, uh, another application we are working on, and um, this is an implementation we are actively writing code on right now, is um, to enable uh, one-way pegs. So I'm going to uh, explain what these are with an example, um, a remote ICO. So here's the idea. Um, it's, it's possible that investors hold money in certain different blockchains, like Litecoin, for example, um, or, um, or Bitcoin in this uh, slide, right? Uh, but they want to buy a certain tokens in the Ethereum blockchain because it's a smart blockchain that enables the tokens to have all of these features. Um, interestingly, they don't really uh, want to go to an exchange and pay the spread or pay the, um, pay the volatility and so on. Uh, but they would like to be able to just immediately pay in Bitcoin and receive the token, right? So this is something that's possible now. And then the, w the way the protocol works is that the company that's fundraising creates the, um, uh, a Bitcoin account, 
in which it will receive the funds. And it creates also a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain um, doing the uh, ERC20 uh, token creation. And then whenever uh, somebody pays with Bitcoin into the company's account, then um, that person paying creates a proof of proof and then puts it into the Ethereum smart contract to receive their fair share of, uh, of company tokens. And so that way it's possible to do uh, ICOs in a smart contract blockchain with a unit of account that lives on a different blockchain. So this, uh, I, th I think this will be very um, interesting to the community once it's uh, possible. Um, now, moving on to two-way pegs. Uh, this is a, a natural extension of the one-way peg. So in the same way that we moved basically payments from the Bitcoin blockchain into the Ethereum blockchain, now we can try to move them back. So if both of these blockchains are smart enough, which, which Bitcoin isn't, but um, let's just go with it. <laughs> um, then you can move tokens first from Bitcoin into uh, Ethereum and then back from Ethereum into Bitcoin. So in the first case, the Bitcoin blockchain uh, fu functions as a source blockchain and the Ethereum as a destination blockchain. And in the second transfer, the destination blockchain is uh, Bitcoin and the source blockchain is Ethereum. Okay, so let's, let's look at what ha what's happening here. Uh, so suppose we create a special account we call X within the, the Bitcoin blockchain and a special account called Y within the Ethereum blockchain. Now, um, we create, within uh, Ethereum Classic, we create this um, token that we call BTC20. Uh, now, I will argue that BTC20 are basically, for all practical purposes, the same as Bitcoin. So they have the same value, and, um, and they would be traded at exactly the same rate as Bitcoin itself. Now, uh, here's how it's, it can work. First, uh, when, every, when every, anybody is paying into the account that we call X within the Bitcoin blockchain, we have a smart contract in Ethereum creating this ERC20 token called BTC20 and uh, giving it to them, handing it to them. Uh, so note that this is just a Bitcoin transfer. It's, nobody has Ethereum, right? But once you put money, Bitcoin money into the X account, you suddenly uh, have BTC20 tokens in the Ethereum blockchain. Now, anything that's within the X account cannot be spent. So it's not like somebody owns the keys to that account and can spend it. It's not owned by, by a company or an individual. Um, but the, the only way to spend account, uh, money that has been transferred to account X is to move BTC20 tokens into the Y account. Okay. So once you move BTC20 into the Y account, which is a transfer on the uh, Ethereum Classic blockchain, then those uh, BTC20 are destroyed and you are given um, the uh, similar value or the exact same value uh, from the X account on the Bitcoin blockchain. So what we have done here is basically we've taken a Bitcoin, moved it to the Ethereum blockchain, and then moved it back. So let's see this in, uh, in pictures. We have these two, um, two, two chains. Uh, you have here a Bitcoin. You put it to some account X that lives on the Bitcoin blockchain. Nobody owns it, right? You create a proof of proof, and that gives you a BTC20 token on the Ethereum blockchain. Now you can trade this as a regular BTC20 token. You can have fast, cheap, and uh, smart transactions. And then you move it to the Y account over here, which just destroys the ERC20 token when you move it there. But by using a proof of proof on this destruction, you can unlock that Bitcoin from the X account that it was originally placed into. And the person that's doing the original deposit to account X could be different from the person doing the withdrawal from the account X eventually. So it could be different owners. You could split it up uh, and, and so on. That's all fine. Um, so while in the Ethereum Classic blockchain we were calling it a BTC20, because you can always turn it into a Bitcoin, it's really worth one Bitcoin. So it retains its asset nature. Okay, so here's uh, the picture, right? Uh, at the top you have BTC, 
that's um, moved into a special account X and recover from the special account X. And then at the bottom, you have the BTC20 token that's exactly equal in value, and it's only created and destroyed based on these events, right? No, no, no. It can be split, and you can, you can transfer some of it back. So if you, let's say you move 10 Bitcoin from the top to the bottom, right, then you pay your rent, right? so 0 0.1 Bitcoin. And then that, uh, the property owner can move that 0 0.1 Bitcoin back and receive their proportion from the locked amount. So the locked amount, count X, is collecting all the amount that has been deposited by all people and can unlock a certain amount, whatever was basically destroyed on, on this portion. So during the destruction, it records how much was destroyed and who is the rightful owner to receive it on the other side. And then you can receive that portion. Yeah, so it's completely divisible, like a regular Bitcoin. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Any other questions about this? All right, so let's go to Cardano. So Cardano, the plan for Cardano is to have two layers, the, the settlement layer and the computation layer or contract layer, and these have different features, right? The, the settlement layer is um, the dump blockchain. Uh, it doesn't sound very nice, but it's actually a good property uh, because its, uh, its features are limited, so we can argue about its security properties. The, the code base is certain amount and we can look at it and hopefully have some provable security on it, some audits on it, and so on. But uh, the computation layer has Turing completeness, which the settlement layer doesn't have. And uh, all the nice things of the computation layer come with the cost that the code base is increased and the uh, surface area of, um, of attack um, is potentially increased, which means that it, it cannot possibly be as secure as a settlement layer because just the code will have to be uh, much more, um, much bigger, right? And this is similar maybe to Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Uh, Bitcoin has this like uh, orthodox approach that we have only these limited features. We are very secure, but we don't add any new features. Ethereum is like innovate quickly, do all these things. Uh, Cardano is trying to do something that will preserve both of these. Um, but then you need to separate the two chains. So in, in Cardano, these are going to be two separate blockchains, and they're going to interface with each other using sidechain techniques. So this is how it's going to look. Um, you are going to have ADA on the uh, settlement layer at the top. Uh, that's where ADA is created. That's where ADA is stored. That's where ADA is uh, kept, like today. right? And then when you want to do a computation in a smart contract, like have a, a DAO or have um, a complex uh, condition on, or a, a DAP, right? You can move it to the computation layer, and then that asset can live for a few blocks in, in the computation layer, and when you're ready, you can move it back. So the idea is that you can use a settlement layer as your store, your, uh, your savings account, and the computation layer, you can use it as your current account, which has more features, and it's, uh, yeah, it's feature-rich, right? So you can maintain both the safety for uh, for your funds that the settlement layer gives you, which is really simple, and then also have the features of the, the computation layer. Uh, hopefully, both of these will be very secure and um, they're going to work great. <laughs> um, so some of the challenges here. Um, in, the, in the Cardano blockchain, the, one of the issues is that the computation layer, when it will uh, be created, when, when the genesis of the computation layer is computed, people will not have stake in it. Um, they will have stake in the settlement layer. So the question is then, how can you maintain the security of the um, computation layer if it doesn't have any stake, if it has very minimal stake? Um, the problem would be uh, an adversary could move some funds to the computation layer and then use that stake to disrupt the execution of that um, computation layer and breaking its security. So we want somehow to inherit the stake from the settlement layer to the computation layer and say that people, based on their ADA stake on the main chain, somehow we want them to inherit staking rights on the computation layer so that we can bootstrap this system in a, in a safe manner. So this is ongoing research with, uh, with Peter and Agalos. Um, and then, um, again, uh, like before, um, ADA is the home asset of the settlement layer 
but it can be moved around. The, the Cardano computation layer doesn't have its own coin. So in a similar way as before, you can think of um, ADA and ADA20. It's exactly the same token, essentially, because it's two-way pegged. Uh, but uh, a token living in Cardano uh, computation layer is by nature a different asset than the asset living on the settlement layer in the sense that it has a different lane, it's a, on a different blockchain, but on the other hand, it's also the same asset because it has the same exact value and you can always uh, turn it back, right? So um, the Cardano um, computation layer is interesting in that it doesn't really have its own coin. It's not a standalone blockchain as before. It's, it's only created as a sidechain and it was always uh, just meant to be a sidechain. Now, um, one of the really, really nice uh, properties about sidechains that I like is the firewall. So the firewall says that if there is a catastrophic failure in the sidechain, we are able to provide still some security properties on the main chain. So what that means, what does catastrophic failure mean? Uh, it is to say that perhaps the sidechain was completely um, destroyed, right? Uh, somebody was able to create an infinite amount of money. Somebody was able to subvert the security features of that chain, um, take, uh, take majority stake and do something bad, and so on, right? We don't want that uh, bad event to affect the main chain. So hopefully both of the chains of Cardano will be very secure, but just in case something very bad happens on the, on the side chain, we can still provide security properties on the main chain. And the way that we do that is we limit the amount of money that can be moved back from the side chain to the main chain to the amount that was moved out. So even if the side chain can create an infinite new amount of money, we will, not be, we will not allow it to move it back to the main chain. So the main chain will be secure in the sense that it will do some accounting and it will know how much money has moved out of it and how much money can be moved back from that particular uh, chain. Okay, so one of the other visions is to have distant sidechains in, in Cardano. So to be able to interface with other existing blockchains or new blockchains. So here's an example of um, Cardano interfacing with uh, Ethereum Classic. Uh, of course, none of this can happen yet, but this is uh, open research, right? Um, the idea here is that in the same way that we did before, you can move Ethereum Classic tokens into the um, Cardano blockchains, and they can retain their nature as Ethereum Classic tokens, be moved around, use all the nice features of uh, Cardano, and then eventually you can also move them back to Ethereum Classic or not. You, know, you can keep them on the Cardano blockchain. And hopefully also vice versa, you should be able to move ADA from the uh, Cardano blockchains into the Ethereum Classic blockchains. Now, what exactly, which of these exactly we're gonna do is a business decision, um, but the technology is there to allow this kind of uh, asset transfer. Um, so what this achieves, if you think about it, is it disassociates the asset from, from the blockchain. A different blockchain can be used to contain any asset from other blockchains. So that's how it looks like. Um, and then another, th another idea that is uh, very exciting is that these distant sidechains can also be um, more traditional systems. So it could be maybe a permission blockchain. So personally, I'm very against permission blockchains. I hate them. But the, the system uses permissions, right? That's the way it works. So you may want to interface with these. If somebody has ADA and it's stored in the Cardano blockchain, that's, a decentral that's going to be a decentralized blockchain. So for me, I'm just going to keep my money there. If somebody wants to interface with a traditional legal system and wants to put their money into a permissioned blockchain, then they can do so by a sidechain interface and then potentially satisfy uh, regulators or, uh, or uh, be happy with, uh, make banks happy with uh, satisfying laws and so on. And this could be, this could be opt-in, this will be opt-in if we ever do it, for the person moving the money. And then on, the, on that traditional blockchain, maybe a private blockchain, you could have gatekeepers, you could have more closed systems that could say, okay, the bank needs to sign off your transaction in order to approve it and so on, right? So you basically take your decentralized money, move it into a more centralized currency, satisfy the um, auditing uh, authorities, and then potentially you can move it back 
So this is very exciting because it's, it provides a smooth way of transitioning out of the old system and into a new system in a way that is uh, gradual. Okay, so uh, there's no reason why all these coins cannot interface with each other, right? So in the future, when we enable sidechains for all of these, all of these can be sidechains of each other. So settlement layer and, and a computation layer can sit in the middle and be the sidechains of each other, but we uh, don't have really a limit as long as the features of the underlying chains are there to make um, each chain a uh, sidechain of another, right? And one interesting thing is that um, we don't really need a central layer for this. So hopefully, this can be a peer-to-peer -peer system between different blockchains. So in this case, for example, um, Monero can interface with Ethereum Classic, but also with the computation layer. But the computation layer can also interface with the Ethereum Classic blockchain without moving through the Bitcoin uh, or through the Monero chain, right? So if you have some Monero on the Monero blockchain, you move it to Ethereum Classic, then you could potentially move that Monero to the Cardano um, computation layer without asking the Monero blockchain what's going on. And, and the question of how we can do this safely and how we can maintain the firewall property and what the firewall property in this case would have to be, what kind of trust assumptions exist between the different blockchains is uh, something left to be defined. But, but hopefully this is something that we can uh, aim for. Okay, so uh, some of the things that sidechains enable uh, in terms of features, uh, one of the interesting or most interesting things in addition to the um, basic like uh, obvious features that I uh, um, explained at the beginning is uh, upgradability. Uh, so this idea is that we could use a sidechain in, in the place of a soft fork or a hard fork. And this could have avoided the, the civil war that uh, was happening in the last two or three years. The idea is that instead of soft forking or hard forking, the developer who wants to add some new features simply creates a new blockchain off of the main chain. So it's a side chain, has all the new features, um, but um, it doesn't need its own currency. So it doesn't need to face a volatility crisis. Um, it, it, there has to be no worry that the token's going to be worthless, right? Because it's always going to be two-way pegged. So if I wanted to create uh, Bitcoin Cash with sidechains, what I would do is I would make Bitcoin Cash a sidechain of Bitcoin, and then I would make the, the Bitcoin Cash coin just pegged to the Bitcoin coin. So it's a two-way peg. And I would be able to move it back and forth without ever going through exchanges, without buying or selling it, just on my own. And then if people eventually wanted to move their Bitcoin into Bitcoin Cash completely because it's faster or cheaper, then eventually all the value of the Bitcoin blockchain would be moved into um, Bitcoin Cash and the community could sunset the, the Bitcoin blockchain eventually. So that would be a more smooth uh, upgrade mechanism and it would be um, also a mechanism to, to abandon ship if we know that a blockchain is uh, going to be eventually insecure. So, for instance, if we at some point develop a, um, a serious vulnerability against the Bitcoin blockchain, but we don't uh, know um, how to exploit it just yet, for example, a vulnerability against uh, SHA-256, uh, we could create a new um, sidechain that has a new hash function, move all the coins there, uh, abandoning ship, and then um, sunset the old blockchain before there is a catastrophic failure. Yeah, that's a difficult question, how, how you do it. Uh, so if you have stake, it's kind of easier because you can borrow stake from the main chain and so on. In, uh, in this case, usually what we do is we, uh, we uh, assume that there's honest majority in both for those proofs, but it's, it's not trivial to see how miners would behave uh, in the real world. So I think what you're asking, uh, Thomas, is that what happens if a miner moves their mining power from the main chain to the side chain for a very weak sidechain in order to destroy it, for instance. That's part of it, but I'm also asking why should miners bother with the sidechain at all? Yeah, so that's a good question. But if, if the sidechain has a, is an upgraded version of the system, they believe in it and they have their coins in it, then they could. But, um, and the sidechain could provide incentives as well. So they, the, the sidechain could uh, allow miners to mine extra coins on it uh, by securing it, right? 
another, another way that was proposed was to do merge mining, to allow merge mining. But then, again, the question is, what are the incentives? Do you want miners to be able to have um, nothing at stake for attacking the sidechain? So in, in the Cardano case, for example, where the computation layer and the settlement layer, they play amicably together, and they're, they're nicely uh, interoperable, and people staking in one will be happy to stake in the other, this works nicely. But if the sidechain is a, maybe um, an enemy chain, like the Bitcoin Cash case, then that would be more complicated. Okay, and then uh, here's another idea with uh, sidechains uh, to enable scalability. Uh, so here we have the settlement layer and the computation layer, but then uh, we have created separate um, chains that are sidechains of the settlement layer, and they are responsible for different industries. So here the idea is that you have a sidechain for electronics, for steel, for travel, and so on, and each of these sidechains could keep transactions within the industry. So if you work in the electronics industry, you could, t as a company, take your money from the settlement layer, move it to the electronics chain, transact with other electronics companies like your, your supplier and so on. And then when you want to transact with somebody outside your industry, you could move your money back into the settlement layer and then into some other industry, right? So the nice part about this is that most transactions hopefully would be within an industry and that would off offload the main chain off of these transactions because they are done completely separate, right? So that's one way to do it. Of course, this has challenges mostly in deciding like, what these are going to be or if you're going to have multiple per industry and so on. But um, one way to solve this is just to allow anybody to create a, a sidechain and work with it. So, um, but this is also uh, an open problem that uh, we're thinking about. Okay, moving on to uh, proofs of proofs. So uh, this is going to be a little bit more technical. So I just want to show you how these uh, work from a um, mathematical point of view, cryptographic point of view, just to have an idea about how the construction looks like. So uh, uh, most of you may be familiar with the uh, proof of work equation where you hash a block and the hash has to be below a certain target value. Who here has uh, seen this before or is familiar with it? Okay, great. So you have the hash function, you have the metadata and the block and, and also the proof of work target. Um, now, we know from uh, the work of uh, Nikos and Agelos um, that we have a, a common prefix theorem. This is one of the security features of, of blockchains, that you can't really have a situation where some blocks, um, you have a deviation from a certain block in the blockchain of more than k is equal to six, let's say, blocks here and also there, right? So what this says is that if, the, if, if a block is confirmed, an adversary cannot really unconfirm it by, by creating a longer blockchain. So in the SPV protocol, where you have a verifier that wants to receive some money, um, what, what you do is you have multiple provers that claim, oh, here's the longest blockchain. And they send uh, the block headers. So the honest player will say, here's the honest chain and the adversarial um, player will say, here is a fake chain, right? And the, in the SPV case, because we can look at block uh, headers, let's say in, in Bitcoin's work case, for example, the verifier can really check the chain for work and then compare their lengths and decide that, oh, the, the um, honest chain is okay, right? By doing this kind of comparison there. Now, this has problems uh, in terms of size, right? Um, so for Bitcoin, for example, the chain is uh, 500,000 blocks. In Ethereum, it's uh, 5 million now. The communication in general is linear to the size of the blockchain. So for every block, you don't have to communicate the whole block, but uh, still you have to send the header. Uh, so the, uh, the question here is, can we, um, can we convince a verifier that this is the right chain without ever sending the right chain. So can we convince them that the, the last portions, the last K blocks of the chain, of the currently honestly adopted chain, are these six blocks without ever sending the whole blockchain? And the answer is yes, so we, we can do that. And the, these are proof of proof of work. So here's the, the gist of the idea. So it's, um, if you look at this equation, um, all blocks have hashes below a certain target but some blocks have hashes much below a certain target. 
So some blocks have um, a hash that's below t halves. Some blocks have hashes that's below t fourths, and so on. And specifically, um, all blocks are zero superblocks. Half the blocks are one superblocks. A quarter of the blocks are two superblocks, and so on. So what's a superblock? Well, a superblock that we call mu superblock is a block that is below target t over 2 to the mu. So um, if you set mu to 2, for example, then the, the equation would say that the hash of the block is below t quarters, right? Um, and so that would be a quarter of the block. Now, the insight here is that these superblocks somehow capture within them the fact that a lot of proof of work has happened around them without having to reveal all the blocks around. Right, so, so here's how the, the a work blockchain looks like. So this is the, the zero level blocks, and some of them are one level blocks, and some of them are two level blocks, and even fewer of them are three level blocks. So you can see they're distributed very nicely. Of course, this is a, a probabilistic data structure, so it may be not exactly right, but it's gonna look about, about that, about like that. Right, so here, the, the nice thing is that if I show you level two, if I just show you those blocks, I can convince you that this work here has happened without ever showing you all the zero level blocks because these blocks capture all the work that was done um, as super blocks, right? So this idea with, with proofs of proofs of work, instead of sending the whole blockchain, uh, I set some parameter m to 128, for example, and then um, I take the Ethereum, for example, uh, blockchain, which is uh, 4 million. Um, and then I say, uh, if I go to level 15 of superblocks, then there I can find 128 blocks. And those are sufficient to, uh, to prove that work has happened. Right? So each of these superblocks captures the fact that a lot of work has happened around without showing all the blocks. Uh, it's a probabilistic method. Okay, so in the proof-of-proof-of-work protocol, the honest prover will provide a short proof, some sample of blocks that are super blocks, to convince the verifier that um, this is the chain, right? And then the adversary will also provide a certain amount of super blocks. And then the verifier will check that um, each of these proofs not only satisfies, um, each, each of the blocks in these proofs not only satisfies the proof-of-work condition, but it also satisfies the mu superblock condition, saying that these are only mu superblocks. And then after I do that, the idea is that I will compare these two by length and see which of them has the most superblocks, and that's the one that uh, would win. So uh, as I showed it to you, the, the problem is that these are just in these proofs, they're just bags of blocks. So an adversary could just rearrange these blocks around and convince me that the chain has a different order, which is something I don't want. So it's really necessary to create pointers between the same level of blocks. So each two-level block has to point back to the same two-level block. So this is something that we call the interlink or the interconnected blockchain. And um, this is exactly the metadata that I mentioned that we need to create side chains. And this does not exist in current or most current blockchains. For example, Bitcoin doesn't have it. Um, and the, the challenge also here is that when you create this block, you will not know if it's going to be a two super block or one super block or just a zero level block before you mine it. So you don't really know which is the right arrow to include. If it becomes a two super block, you need this arrow. If it becomes a one super block, you need that arrow, right? So the way we solve this is before mining this block, we create all of these arrows. We put them in here, and then we mine it, and then one of them is going to be right. But the number of arrows is going to be just logarithmic in the number of blocks in the whole chain. So it doesn't really add up uh, much space to, to the blockchain structure. Um, OK, so this is how, how proofs of uh, proof of work look like. Uh, so the prover will show certain super blocks to show that a certain amount of proof of work has happened. So it will, have, it will have to go back to Genesis, of course. And then eventually, once, um, once it shows that the longest chain is here, then they, they also uh, show the suffix here of the last k blocks that the verifier is interested about. So this is how, how it will be constructed. 
Uh, we call the prefix pi and we call the suffix he. And uh, these are security parameters that are specified by the verifier. So you need at least a certain amount of blocks on the superblock level and a certain amount of blocks at the suffix level. If you just ask for one superblock to just represent the whole blockchain, you have uh, things like backhack attacks where um, you don't you can be vulnerable to, to variance attacks. So the adversary could get lucky maybe once in creating a superblock, but they can't get lucky m times, which could be 128. Okay, so I have here the protocol for anyone who wants to read it. Uh, I will upload the slides later. I don't want to go through it. It's uh, a bit more complicated than one, what I uh, described. And uh, these are the interactive proofs. Uh, this is uh, older work from uh, two years ago. And then um, we also have non-interactive proofs where uh, the scheme is a bit more complicated. Uh, but in the end, uh, these are just uh, pieces of blocks, right? So just sets of blocks. In the non-interactive case, you have to include a few more blocks, but again, they're just logarithmic in the size of the chain. Uh, and if you collect all these blocks in the uh, non-interactive case, which we also call NipoPal, um, in the non-interactive case, what you do is you create these nice strings that allow you to create side chains. So they're, they're uh, proofs that don't need any interaction between the verifier and the prover once the prover has constructed this proof. And these proofs are um, short and they're also succinct and they allow you to prove anything that has happened um, from Genesis till now. So one of the interesting uh, parts of this construction is if you have certain superblocks that are a very high level, sometimes you want to prove that something happened between them. And this is the way to do it. So uh, I'm just keeping this part of the construction as an interesting portion. So if you're proving something on level four, um, then normally this will point directly to this four. But if you want to prove that this block was included because a transaction is of interest to you, then you can do this nice trick where this contained the three pointer because of the construction I described before. This contained a two pointer, a one pointer, and then eventually you can go down in just a logarithmic number of steps. So it's like um, maybe um, if you're familiar with the uh, lowest common ancestor problem or a heavy weight decomposition in, in algorithms and such techniques, uh, basically you just use a data structure which has, which can do these jumps, right? So these jumps, um, like if this is a, a four block jump, then it becomes a two block jump and a one block jump. So it, it, you get really quickly down to uh, the block that you need. Okay, and one more application I want to uh, mention before I close this talk is that we can have light SPV clients with these proofs. So in addition to having side chains, um, light SPV clients uh, are also enabled. So an, a light SPV client could be an embedded device or a mobile phone that doesn't really need to download all the blockchain headers. So we all know that we have SPV and we don't need to, to download the whole blockchain, but with this construction, we don't even need to download all the block headers. We just bootstrap it very quickly. So we have a mobile phone that has just the Genesis block and then it downloads 128 blocks and it's synced, right? Doesn't need to download all the intermediaries because it has a, enough of a representative sample of blocks to know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, could you repeat what a superblock is? Sure, so a superblock, so if you have a block, then its hash is below a certain target T. Some of the blocks will be much, uh, would have a hash that's much less than T. So some blocks will be below T halves. These are called one superblocks. Some blocks will be below T quarters. These will be two super blocks. Some will be below T eighths. Those will be three super blocks. And in general, mu super blocks will be blocks that are hashed below T over two to the mu. Okay? So this is why we have this nice um, distribution where you have powers of two. Uh, does that make sense? Okay. So this is how we do light SPV. And there's a couple blockchains that uh, are being worked on. Um, the most prominent, I think, is by Alex Chepournoy called Ergo, which uh, has these proofs uh, embedded into their system from the beginning and allows clients to prove things very quickly. So this, this is very interesting. Okay, so for sidechains now, things are easy, right? Because we have these proofs of proofs of work, we can use these 
to say that something happened on the remote blockchain, right? So we just take this one, we keep a certain amount of blocks as, uh, as a representative, and then we include the infix portion as, as I described to say that an event happened, right? We compress it into this nice string, and then we put this into that other blockchain. And then the smart contract in the, in the blockchain below can just check for syntactic correctors and proof of work, the proof of proof of work to say that it has enough super blocks and so on. So that's, that's how it would work and that's how you can achieve uh, isolation as well. Okay, so some future work, uh, there's a lot of open questions in this area. One is proofs of proofs of stake that's being worked on. Uh, another one is how we can do side chains on Ouroboros using some of these mechanisms, which is a paper we're writing now. Um, then uh, another question is, how succinct are these really, um, the proofs of proofs of work? Are they really short in every case? Or are there cases that are adversarial where they could be longer? And this is a problem we're exploring with Nikos and Agelos in a, in a new paper also. Um, another question that nobody, I don't think, is addressing is, can this model work in the variable difficulty setting where targets are adjusted? So our security proofs are just for targets that are constant. Uh, I think that this construction will work for every case, but there is no, we don't have a proof for that. So that's also an open question. And then, um, of course, there's also uh, the question of actually implementing it and seeing it uh, in the wild. And this is um, a project that's being done by Jorgos Christoglou and Arthur Gerweiss in uh, Imperial. So they just started um, playing with this ICO example that I gave before between, um, between Litecoin and Ethereum Classic, uh, hopefully. So this will allow um, cross-chain uh, transactions to, to be uh, realized for the first time. So this is very exciting to see. Uh, so here's some papers. I will put up the slides uh, or email them to you. I don't know. I'll talk to Tam, I guess. And then um, that's it. Thanks.